Welcome everyone to the Google Hangout with Denise Hall talking on how to make you or how to ensure your business is saleable when it actually comes time to sell. I have had the pleasure of hearing Denise actually speak a couple of times and I really have to say that this talk is hugely invaluable for anyone in business in any stage of business. Even if you're starting out in business, it's absolutely imperative to know this sort of stuff when you're getting started. It's going to get you the best start in business and hopefully the best end in business. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Denise now and I hope you enjoy the hangout. All right, Denise, take it away. Mm, thank you very much. Thank you, Ellie. Okay, can we all see that? Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Ali. Um, it's always my pleasure to speak to the Motivating Mum community because there's usually much uh, uh, anticipation and much discussion around, you know, what business looks like and, and what to do with it. But today, yes, we're talking about a saleable asset, but I actually want to concentrate it on it from a freedom perspective. And that comes from a different, couple of different places. One is, why did you start the business in the first place? I.e., I suspect that you started it because you had a particular freedom in mind. It was about generating additional income for your family, uh, contributing to the household purse, um, wanting to, especially if you're at home with little ones, wanting to stay as, as part of the community as well and not just kind of feel that you're locked at home. So there was that freedom aspect but also once you get into that, I, I suspect some of you are probably questioning, questioning sorry, the freedom of that. Um, you know, what kind of decision did I make? Did I make the right one? This isn't working out the way I had hoped. And so what I want to talk to you about how you then come to the second part of the freedom which is if it's not working, what do you do with it, how do you get out, how do you need to structure it, etc. So here, here's what I'm aiming for. This is what I would love every woman business owner to do is to create a business that has a million dollar revenue or more. Now, as you can see from this Wall Street Journal um, article recently, only 3% of women-owned businesses have a revenue of one million or more. Now, fortunately, I will give you uh, a bit of my history as we go through this so that you kind of know where I come from. And so I fit into that 3%. When I had my own business, which I sold three and a half years ago, uh, it was doing over seven figures at time of sale. So I'm kind of one of these three percenters and, and I find that that three percent number is really quite low and I find it quite staggering because there's so many of us that start and I understand life kind of gets in the way and I understand a lot of a lot of stuff happens uh, to be able to reach this mark but for me it's you know this is the aim why would you go through all the time energy and effort to not build something of size and in my world it's about building an asset, it's another asset for your family, it's another asset that generates revenue for you. Um, but this, this is the goal for me, this, this is where I would love you all to get to, um, you know, world domination, why not? Now in order to get there, I suspect again that a number of you uh, have set up your businesses whereby you seem to be almost second income. Um, that it's an addition to some preliminary monies that are already coming into the family. Now, in my case, that wasn't what happened. I, I am actually the sole breadwinner, so I had no choice. I had to make some serious decisions and business was the decision I made because I felt that I had more control and more freedom over what I could and couldn't do within that context. So I was very much, and this is where the 3% part sits, is down that right hand side of this. So when you're setting up a business, it's very much about high startup cost, doesn't always have to be, mine certainly wasn't, but there is some startup cost involved. 
it's based on systems, i.e. it doesn't revolve around the owner, which is the next line. It has a value outside the principal, outside the business owner. It can be sold. Low profit margin, maybe, not always. Um, high overheads, generally speaking, because that may depend on staff. But of course, we can get a lot more clever about that now as well. Requires capital injections for growth. If you can treat that by cash flow, though, that's that's the same type of thing. Um, and once you start getting bigger, you're just generally less agile and less responsive. And, and as you know, there's generally a larger team around you. Now, I guess that most of you are probably building what I would call a practice or even as a solo typepreneur. Um, a practice very much is around the owner and that's where it's low start up. It's based on you, the expert. Um, I question that it has no value outside the principle. Sometimes it does, but we can get clever about how to do that. It can't be sold in its current form, probably not, but again, that's where the cleverness comes in. It generally does have a higher profit margin. That means you get to keep more. Overheads are low, especially if you're able to run it from your home office. Uh, cash be, can be cash flow funded and generally you can uh, be a lot more agile in the market and you work with a smaller team as you're aware. Now, ooh, um, oh, what's happening? Okay, now some of you may have seen this before, I'm not sure, but I'll go through my journey on this as well. Uh, First off, just to kind of show you where I went, and then I'd like to encourage you to do the same thing, especially based on the definitions that I've just previously given you. So if we look down the bottom there, we start, you know, we've got the dream, freedom is in mind. And so depending on the path we take, we'll determine how well we do about getting there. So we've got options, we've got the self, are we going to go self-employed or are we going to go a job? Now given that most of you are working and in with the Motivating Mum community, my guess is you've gone self-employed, which may be about buying a job. And I'll go into that a little bit later on. Once you decide to do your own thing though, then the question is, am I going to buy one that is in existence or am I going to build my own? That depends on uh, your expertise, your cash flow situation. It depends on a lot of things for you to come up with that answer. Bearing in mind that on the build side, it can take up to two to three years to generate revenue and you're starting from scratch. On the buy side, you are able to generally walk into revenue or certainly into something that you know how to create revenue from straight up. So um, it's important to know what you're doing. and But also too, if you haven't got the money up front to buy, and especially these days with online businesses, you actually don't have to have a lot to buy in, um, but nonetheless, if you don't have it, you don't have it and you've got no option to build. Then the question is, what am I building or what am I buying? And this goes back to, is it a practice? Does it revolve around me? Is it a buying a job type scenario? Is it around building a business as an asset, which is on the right hand side there? Business as an asset that does not revolve around me. And then you've got the franchise, which is a kind of a hybrid of the two in some respects. So, you know, some of the systems have been built for you. You don't have to do that, but you're not generally walking into revenue and you are actually responsible for doing that yourself. And then regardless of what you are looking to build, you have to be responsible for, especially if it's yours, the marketing, the sales, operational fulfilment, service delivery, and the financials and the metrics. So if I take my own example, I started, I decided that I was going to go self-employed because I didn't want to go the job because I felt that they would own more of my hours than I was prepared to give. I decided I was actually didn't build or buy, I was actually handed the shell of something that had a good core <laughs> but had been let to die off. So um, I still, it was still my responsibility to build it, but I didn't have to start from scratch, which in some respects was a bonus, but in others it, not so much. But nonetheless, it worked. Um, I worked it so that it worked. I decided to build a business because I wanted it to um, 
work without me. I ended up having uh, three other entrepreneurial mothers work with me. I ended up taking on a business partner. Um, we ended up taking a lot of our earlier process, our front end type process online, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it was it was bigger than me. And then by doing that, some of the responsibilities around the four departments uh, didn't all sit with me either. So the people that we, the entrepreneurial mothers that we had working with us. Um, looked at certainly after the operations and the metrics of which we obviously had an overview um, and I handled some of the marketing and some of the sales and so did the business partner. So I would just um, encourage you, it's, it doesn't have to be now but I would encourage you over time to just, just think through what your path is for now and where you're heading because you'll see that there's now a gap between the four departments and the finish line. And I call that no woman's land sitting there. Uh, that's generally because we haven't thought that through. Now, yes, we talk about starting with the end in mind and, and you know, you should always be ready to sell and all the rest of that. But sometimes that is really difficult to do because you don't have a context around what that can look like. That said, if you're covering off all, this, all that I have mentioned so far, you're going to be a lot closer to being saleable anyway. But now I want to start exploring that no woman's land there so we can actually get to a finish line. So how to finish. Now the role I play as a business broker and exit strategist is that little red dot in the middle. <laughs> and the reason that I play that role is for any business to be sold, assuming that the way you want to finish is to sell. There are other options, but at the moment we're talking about creating a saleable asset. So assuming that you want to sell, there are a number of parties to that process. There's a seller, which would be you, there's a buyer, and there's the market realities around what you're trying to sell. Now the role I play is knowing, is, is I almost playing matchmaker between the buyer and the seller but also knowing what the market realities are around the business that you're looking to sell and the industry that you're in and current market forces, etc., etc. Now, you may have accountants and so forth that you work with that will say that they can sell it for you. I question that and the reason I question that is because they don't usually have access to the market realities because they're busy looking after their client, which is either the seller or the buyer. They, general, they can't know both because they can only act for one party. So just bear that in mind. So that's where the likes of a business broker comes, third party, knows the markets, is playing in this all the time and uh, can certainly offer advice on that uh, in that context. So. We're looking at a business that we want to sell. We've made the decision that taking it to market is what we want to do. So what, as a buyer, am I looking for? Now, just bear, coming back to that freedom piece, the reason a buyer will buy it is because they think they're buying the freedom. So they're not thinking that they have to start. They're thinking that there's a fabulous base there that I can then build my freedom on. And in order to know that, the types of things that they are looking for, so they've got their buyer's goggles on, and what they're looking for, does it make a profit? Is there some negotiation in the sale? Is, am I able to renovate the business? So it might very well be doing okay till now, but I not, might know that there are other things to do. Or... I can see where there's a gap and I know how to renovate it. So is there still some scope in there for it to gain more value? Can it be automated? Again, taking the pressure off the owner. Can I grow it? And that might be taking it into different industries and different, different places. And is it actually saleable? Which takes us almost back to if it revolves around the owner, it's harder for that to happen. 
So I would encourage any of you, if, if this is a path that you're thinking of taking, then go and complete the saleability score dot-com.au. It's, it's, it's a questionnaire, it takes you about 13 minutes and you go through and you fill in a number of questions. Some of the questions might sound a bit big for you, they may not, but some might. If they do, just battle on through, but it gives us a good line in the sand because the beauty about this is that you, could, you can do one now and then you can do one in 12 months time and see where the shift is. Now, the questionnaire asks around eight attributes. You'll see there are nine there. I've added the U one in because that's very important, but I'll come back to that in a minute. So what are these attributes? What are, what's a buyer looking for? So they're looking for clean financials. So none of your, all your personal stuff is in there. They're looking for clean financials and ideally as profitable as possible. So if we go down the left-hand side, I'm looking for recurring revenue. So what I'm looking for there is how sustainable is what you're selling me? So things like um, subscription models work a treat there because that money comes in without you having to go find it. And then the bottom left-hand side is structure. So if your name is in all those boxes, that's not necessarily a good thing either. So how do we replace your name in those boxes? Then if we go down the middle, is there growth left in the business? Where can I take it? How can I build it? Where does the value lie? Now value in a business is you've got, I'm, I'm sure that you will probably have heard, a business is valued based on its profit and on its multiple. Now all the multiple means is that it's a number times the profit to come up with some kind of sale price. You'll hear people bandy around three times, very dependent on industry and very dependent on um, recency of the business will determine what that multiple is. But nonetheless, there's profit versus multiple. Now, the point about the multiple is where the, the good stuff sits that makes it more valuable to the buyer. And what I mean by that is if it's got the subscription model, that's more valuable to a buyer. If it's automated, it's more valuable to a buyer. If it's profitable, it's more valuable to a buyer. And each of these add up to a more robust discussion around the multiple. I won't go too far into that because can take a bit to get your head around but just understand that the value is kind of the intangible stuff that sits there that makes it work really really well and the profit is the scorecard of how well it does. Barrier to entry, how hard is it for somebody else to replicate what you're doing? Then if we go on the right hand side, your reliance on, is uh, do you have a reliance on any one customer, on any one employee, or any one supplier. Generally, if there is a, a, a you know a one or two pe persons in each of these spots, it will question how how significant that would be if they are not around. So you need to be able to address that and answer that. The middle one on the right hand side there, that's customer satisfaction. How well are you regarded and how well do people know you? How often do they buy from you? How many recurring customers do you have? Do you run a net promoter score? Do you run surveys? Like how do you know that customers are satisfied? And this may even be where a referral program can sit as well, which again adds value. And then just as importantly as the eight attributes within a saleability score, this bottom right hand corner U is incredibly important because you have to be really, you, you are the one that is selling the business therefore you have to be okay about doing that. Now if this business has been a member of your family and has played a role in your life for some time, you can't just give that away and not replace it. There has to be a way and there are many ways of doing this, 
and this is actually where it's really good to talk to someone else, maybe even a mentor or a coach of some sort. But this notion of what are you going to do next is really, really, really important. And just saying I'm going to have a rest is not enough. It's, it's not enough. I'm going to take 12 months off and play golf. It's not enough. You need to be, it, it, it's enough as an answer, but that will wear, if you've been really busy doing this for a long time, and not replacing that with something that is substantial to you, it's just you're going to struggle because you know it's like, oh, I'll just play golf. Okay, you can't play golf every day for a period of time and not probably get sick of it. So that the you part is actually um, very important. And in fact, I like to start at that you part first before we get into the other because that's how important I think that is because it is all about you. So if you are looking to exit and you're thinking, I want to start with the end in mind today regardless of how old my business is, this is a way to help you map that out. So, on, so let's start on the right hand side. Is there a date? Is there an age? Is there a, an event? What is it that will be the exit date for you? What are you aiming for, right? What is that exit date? And then you work backwards. Depending how the business revolves around you and it might mean that you need to go with the sale to ensure that transition help happens quite smoothly and that relationships are transitioned over time quite smoothly, that might take six months. It might take 12 months. It just, it does depend. It's definitely business and industry specific, but nonetheless. So whatever your date age is on the, in, at the exit part there, you would then take six months or 12 months off where that earn out begins here, right? And then a transaction can take between three to 12 months, if not longer, again, depending on the type of industry and size and so forth. But you might then at, trans at the transaction part, 